Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we're going to be talking about Square Enix and Crystal Dynamics, the Avengers Project, which, if you're familiar with at all, has seen no small shortage of controversy in its relatively short lifespan. Now, the latest on this particular game comes from a headline from Video Games Chronicle entitled Square Enix claims Crystal Dynamics was the wrong fit for disappointing Marvel's Avengers. Company's president says it needs to learn lessons from the much-criticized game's performance. Now, I have a number of things to say about this headline and the story of Crystal Dynamics and the Avengers, but I want to get a few things out of the way first. One, I like Video Games Chronicle. I like VGC. I like the folks that run it. I have written for this particular outlet, but like anyone else, that doesn't make them perfect. And here I see a number of interesting things that were done. Headlines are going to be headlines. They're never going to be a perfect fit for what an article actually says, but there are right ways and there are wrong ways to do them. Here, I think is one of the more notable wrong ways. And that's by combining actual quotations with editorialization in the headline itself. So when I saw this initially, I looked at this and I said, hmm, that's strong words for a corporate actor. Square Enix saying Crystal Dynamics was the wrong fit, very strong. But if you look very closely at this headline, you see the wrong fit isn't in quotation marks. Disappointing is, and that in fact is the only kind of linchpin quote that appears in this headline at all. We're going to take a look at the language that Square Enix used, but they don't use wrong fit. They talk about this particular issue in a very different way. Now, what is this issue? Put plainly, it's that Crystal Dynamics was never really in a great position to run a game as a service. And when I use that term, I don't mean every game in existence because it has DLCs or expansions or things that you can buy off the PlayStation Store or otherwise. I mean a game that has been designed in part to be ongoing to constantly morph into something new. I'm thinking of Destiny. I'm thinking of The Division. I'm thinking of those games that sell you skins, that sell you packs, that keep changing a storyline or content on a regular basis. And that's what the Avengers wanted to be. This game was divided into a single player campaign that I would say is good and verging on great in some places and a games-as-a-service cooperative experience, which was never really anything more than average. And so Crystal Dynamics has been dealing with that fact of life, not just the technical capacity at the company for actually building something that is always online and cooperative, but also the fact that they just didn't have the background to make a -a game-as-a-service game, and the result was poor communications, poor decision-making, and poor design that led to an Avengers product that even if you like it, like I do, I think it's okay, isn't remotely close to leveraging the size of the Avengers brand, certainly as it was in the Infinity War and Endgame kind of years. But even now, you don't realize the kind of income stream that you want if you're Square Enix from the product as it exists today. And I'm going to give one example of this. It's relatively recent. But if you've been following the game, you might know some of this. In March of this year, Crystal Dynamics went in and said, we're going to change the way your experience works. We're also going to change the way cosmetic works. We're going to offer you fewer of them, but we're going to leave that aside for a second. They're desperately trying to figure out how to monetize continued support of this game because they had made a number of promises, one of the biggest of which was, we're not going to charge for extra characters. We're not going to charge for extra content. We're trying to monetize this thing basically only on cosmetics. And we'll see that again in just a second. In March of this year, they decided to roll back the experience that you earned. And this is important in a game like Avengers because the experience that you earn is actually earning you something called skill points, which directly affects, certainly in the early levels, the actual abilities that you have as a character in the game. And then in the later levels, things like percentage increases and crit chances and those types of things, which do impact your gameplay experience, but not at the same level as not being able to do this specific combo attack or something along those lines. The argument they gave in March was that the XP curve doesn't exist and that's led to pacing issues such as skill points being rewarded too fast 
which may be confusing and overwhelming to newer players. Based on these issues, we'll be increasing the amount of XP needed to level up, starting from around level 25, and we'll increase the closer you get to level 50 so that it will take longer to reach higher levels and will only affect character level, not power level. That's the power of your gear at the same time. Now, at the moment that this decision was made, I don't know that anybody really liked it. I did a cheeky video entitled Avengers Cut the Player Base in Half. We'll do it ourselves with a picture of Thanos, of course, from the MCU. And I don't think it was very well received, even in its initial offerings. But it got worse. Again, we're talking about a company in Crystal Dynamics that I really like, that has made a lot of games that I've enjoyed throughout my video gaming career, that made a good single-player version of the Avengers, that made playing as each of the Avengers enjoyable on a moment-to-moment basis, but just missed all of what makes a games-as-a-service game even remotely work for those of us that aren't inclined to just dive into Destiny for 3,000 hours or what have you. And I wanted to bring up how Crystal Dynamics talked about this particular issue in a Games Industry Biz article. I think I've got a blog post and, and a few other things in this video as well to talk about what they were aimed at to see what Crystal Dynamics was trying to do. It says, after you go through all of that, the story arcs, the missions, the hero arcs, then you get to the end and it's like, wow, there's a whole world out there. 99% of the stuff we are adding is playable single player, but it's also co-op enabled. Now that you've gone through that story campaign that sets up the stakes in the world, the next step is saying there's all this stuff to do. Global threats are ever escalating, new levels, new heroes showing up at no additional cost. Crystal Dynamics, says the author of this article, has already ruled out loot box mechanics, which were under fire at the time they were designing this game. So how do they expect to fund all this? Well, we've been thinking about that from the beginning. We want somebody to be able to go buy a disc and never have to go online. You don't have to. The idea from the beginning is that we want you to be able to customize your hero, how they look, how they play, the gear they have, and how they use it. Your Black Widow could be different to my Black Widow, just a little, maybe a lot, depending on what you favor and how you unlock things, in terms of how we monetize, we'll have cosmetics, no gameplay paywalls. And you see this in other places as well. August 2020, we have also committed that content purchasable with real money in Marvel's Avengers will be aesthetic only additions, which will ensure we can keep the game fresh for years to come. These are voluntary statements on the part of Crystal Dynamics, on the part of Square Enix. And they are designed with a purpose. As we talk about in this space, oh so often, you make statements to an audience in order to convey some kind of message. In respective marketing materials like this, you want folks to be more attracted to your product. So you get out in front. You say, oh, we're not going to do loot boxes. No, we're not going to charge for things that affect gameplay. There will be no gameplay paywalls. Aesthetic-only additions is a very narrow class of things that we are going to allow ourselves to sell so that you, potential customer, are motivated to buy this product because we're not going to take advantage of that particular purchase later on selling you something that affects your gameplay. Well, if you've been in the video game industry at all, if you've been in virtual reality before, you know where this is going. And that's as of a couple of months ago, they added a few things. Marvel Avengers War Table Weekly Blog, Week 58, October 6th, 2021. What did they add? Well, they said, we've added a consumable category in the marketplace where you can purchase Heroes Catalysts and Fragment Extractors. You can purchase a consumable with a one-day duration for 100 credits, a three-day duration for 250 credits, or seven days for 500 credits. Now, what do these consumables do? Well, among other things, they increase the rate at which you gain experience. If you haven't been following the story, yes, what Crystal Dynamics did was look at the XP curve, say, we're giving you too much XP too fast. We're going to slow it down so that you're not confused. And then they sold you back the ability to increase that XP curve. As you can imagine, this went very poorly in internet land. And it doesn't take a genius to see that you don't do this sequence of events if you're Crystal Dynamics. But I don't fully blame them. It's a very unusual set of skills for a company that's primarily built around making single-player adventure games. You go and you look at what Crystal Dynamics has made. First of all, you see them originating in the 3DO era. I love the 3DO era. The 90s were fun. You get the Horde, one of my favorites, RPG, 
features full motion video and Kirk Cameron acting against cartoon goblin ogre things. If you can pick that up or find a video of it, highly recommended. Gex, single player kind of platformer game. And you can go down and down and down. And in the more modern era, you see Legacy of Kane, you see Soul Reaver, Blood Omen, Defiance, and then ultimately getting to what we know them for now, mostly. Tomb Raider, the new Tomb Raiders, until you get to Marvel's Avengers and, and Perfect Dark. That'll be one to watch as well. And if you look at this list, you see something. You see Crystal Dynamics is not a company that is making something like a Destiny. Now, to be fair, Bungie wasn't a company that was making something like a Destiny before they did. So it's not impossible that Crystal Dynamics could pull it off flawlessly, even though Bungie has given example after example about how they're not pulling it off flawlessly, even if they are more successful than the Avengers project. And because of that, there is a kind of square peg into a round hole problem. And we see it even as they try to apologize for the mistakes that they've made. Just a few days ago, Marvel's Avengers, we have decided that by the end of today, we will remove Heroes Catalysts and Fragment Extractors for purchase. And I want to pay attention to this message because they get one major thing wrong. We apologize for not responding sooner to your concerns about the addition of paid consumables in the marketplace. We introduced them as an option for an evolving player base and did not see them as pay to win since they don't offer power directly. After considering your feedback, we've decided that by the end of today, we will remove Heroes Catalysts and Fragment Extractors for purchase. They will continue to be earnable rewards and those already owned are still usable. We hope that this can be the first step in rebuilding your confidence in us as a team. It continues to be our goal to make the very best game possible. Thank you for being a part of the Marvel's Avenger community. Now, as I said, they made one really significant error in messaging, in my opinion here. Do you see it? It's the second sentence of this particular statement. We apologize. Totally fine. After considering your feedback, we're getting rid of them. We hope this can be a step forward towards rebuilding your confidence in us. All great. But that second sentence is the kind of excuse making that you see from someone that doesn't really want to apologize right here, doesn't really want to take this step, doesn't feel that they are actually in the wrong. We introduced them as an option for an evolving player base and did not see them as pay to win since they don't offer power directly. And that is specious, right? It's an argument without merit. And it's one that really strains credibility. You've got a message out here. Your goal is to tell people to trust us again. And in the very second sentence of your message, you give a line that, at least to me, raises a yellow flag, a red flag, says, ooh, you don't really get it. One, because you don't use the term pay to win in all the number of times that you say you're not going to have gameplay paywalls. You're going to limit your purchases to aesthetics only. You don't use that term. You might have been using it internally. But secondly, how is XP that directly contributes to the attributes of your character and in the early levels to the things you can do with that character not a function of your ability to play that game? And if you can pay to get that advancement earlier, then you're paying to improve your status. Pay to win is always kind of a weird amorphous phrase because if you aren't playing against another player, which you don't in Avengers, it's unclear exactly what it means. But certainly... It represents a gameplay advantage to those that want to give us more money. So you sitting there and saying, we didn't think it was that big of a deal is frankly just not something that I believe. You feel like you've been forced into a corner and that we can see even in the other conversations they have with folks. Here's a Reddit sub thread from just about an hour ago where someone is summarizing what they heard in a discord on the Avengers. Now we, of course, take this with a grain of salt as we do with anything else that isn't fully sourced, but it does match up with what we've seen from the Avengers folks at Crystal Dynamics. They said they didn't like people quoting Megan, which I imagine is one of the people that says these cosmetic type things, because she said there would be no pay to win advantages and the boosters didn't necessarily affect gameplay. Two, they apologize to the community for not communicating properly on the issue. They will release some form of monetized consumables again in the future but next time they will better communicate with us about it. So you are going to have a breach in all likelihood of the marketing speak that was used in the early days of trying to sell access to this game. To some extent, that's going to be acceptable, I would imagine, to a significant part of the audience if it's presented correctly because they don't want their game to die. 
If Avengers just goes away completely, the people that like playing Avengers aren't benefited by that. So there's likely going to be an allowance of some wiggle room there from the public relations side of things. But certainly just from the, hey, we're not lying to you side of things, unless you come out there and say, well, situations have changed. This is going to go under. We need to do something honest with your audience. Then it's still walking back a promise that you made in those early days. Three, They acknowledge that in multiple blogs, they have said they will only charge for cosmetics. And he doesn't exactly know why the community team said that as that wasn't true, which belies another issue, both internally in terms of communication from the right hand to the left hand, but also in terms of the fact that this appears to have been something that was contemplated at Crystal Dynamics for a long time. That wasn't true implies that this person at least thinks that it wasn't true at the time that they made those statements, which also poses the question of why Crystal Dynamics didn't correct them when they were out there in the public and in the wild. So none of this set of statements, this communication to your audience rings as accurate, rings as full of truthfulness. And that's a fundamental problem in operating a game as a service. Crystal Dynamics, however you feel about the Avengers as it turned out, and this is a game that I actually enjoy playing is clearly a little bit out of its depth in actually running the relationship with its community, which leads us to VGC talking about wrong fit. Now, where did they get this from? They got this from the 2021 annual report of Square Enix. Now, there's a couple of things that are important to note as part of looking at this. One is that This is as of March 31st, 2021. That's how Square Enix does its annual reports. The document itself, as best I could tell, was not dated in terms of its statements. We don't know exactly when the executives that are speaking in this document made the statements that they were making. But we do know that Avengers has continued past that point in March of this year doing things. Not the least of which is, right, that XP change, the sales of new catalysts, everything else has happened after that report is effective. Doesn't mean the statement wasn't made after that March 31st date either, because these things take a time to be compiled. But it does mean that we don't exactly know Square Enix's feelings on Crystal Dynamics and the Avengers as of this moment in time. The fact that we were given knowledge of this annual report doesn't mean that those statements were made right now. In fact, in general, when you're putting together a document like that, those statements from the executives are at least a few months old. Doesn't mean things haven't gotten worse for Crystal Dynamics and the Avengers, but it also doesn't mean things haven't gotten better. And we know very recently they've made a number of announcements. Avengers went to Game Pass, which is another avenue for them to potentially monetize access to this game. They announced that Spider-Man, which is clearly a contractual obligation, of Square Enix to Sony is coming exclusively to PlayStation on November 30th. We'll see how that goes. This might be the last big update for the game, or it might be the start of making something out of the project overall, which leads us to the statement itself. And I'm going to read it in whole, and then I'm going to comment on it. This is the last thing we're going to be talking about in this video. So pay attention because I think you'll see exactly why the headline of Square Enix blaming Crystal Dynamics, saying they're a poor fit, is at best only a partial takeaway from what is being said here. I would also note that Marvel Avengers was an ambitious title for us in that we took on the games as a service model. We overcame a variety of unexpected difficulties in the final phase of the game's development, including needing to transition to work from home due to the pandemic. We were able to surmount these challenges and release the game, but it has unfortunately not proven as successful as we would have liked. Nonetheless, taking on the gas model highlighted issues that we are likely to face in future game development efforts, such as the need to select game designs that mesh with the unique attributes and tastes of our studios and development teams. While the new challenge that we tackled with this title produced a disappointing outcome, we are certain that the gas approach will grow in importance as gaming becomes more service-oriented. How we go about creating new experiences by incorporating this trend into our game design is a key question that we will need to answer going forward. And that's the entirety of the statement on this matter. That is what drove the VGC headline and a lot of commentary and copycat headlines arriving from that headline. And yet there's a couple of things that happen here, a number of which you probably noticed, some of which you might not have. 
And first and foremost is that Crystal Dynamics isn't mentioned here, right? Crystal Dynamics, which made Marvel's Avengers, everybody knows made Marvel's Avengers. You could read between the lines, but they aren't mentioned by name here. You don't see reference to anything being a poor fit. You see conceptually that idea. But most importantly to my eye, you see a couple of things. One, you see a company in Square Enix that is fully aware of the fact that the big publishers in video gaming are making a lot more of their revenue through games as a service mechanisms. If you go and you look at the Electronic Arts financials, you'll see that recurring revenue stream of games as a service through FIFA and other places becoming a larger and larger and larger part of their budget. Square Enix would be silly to not observe that happening and not be trying to figure out a way that they can take their intellectual property, their skill set, their talent, and make something that has a similar kind of revenue benefit for their bottom line. You and I don't have to like it. You might be in love with narrative single player games. I certainly am. And I don't tend to like the games as a service game quite as much. But as a company head, it is your obligation to figure out what the trends are and to maximize the resources that you have at your disposal. And Square Enix is doing the right thing to say, we have to be aware of this and figuring out how to use it. When it comes to the Avengers though, they're making an important point, which is that essentially they have to match their square pegs, pun very much intended, with the round holes that the gas offers and find a way to make them work. They need to select game designs that mesh with the unique attributes and tastes of our studios and development teams. Crystal Dynamics was never all that into you, gas. And Square Enix is all but taking the blame for themselves, saying, look, we picked the wrong game design. The parties that were asked to make this thing, to explore this gas approach, didn't understand it, didn't want to understand it. We don't know exactly why the Avengers turned out the way that it did. We can only kind of judge things in retrospect, looking at the product as it exists today and say, well, They make all sorts of communications issues. They had all sorts of technical problems having this cooperative suite in their game. It never really worked. And Square Enix is sitting back here and saying, we need to match these things up better. And to be frank, the Square Enix stable of studios might not have anyone that is an obvious candidate for making these games as service games. And so Square says, we're going to keep following this because it's important and there's a way to make money here but we're going to have to keep looking at it because clearly it's the wrong answer to just take one of our assets and say, you go make a gas game, even though you've never made one before and you might not be inclined to do so. That's a company that I think is doing the right thing, asking the right questions, looking at a situation where the Avengers actually sold decently well and its current financials reflect the fact that without the Avengers on their calendar, they have less money coming in from just overall sales of original games, the absence of the Avengers, as well as the absence of Final Fantasy VII Remake as an, as an initial sale. And so Square Enix is looking at this and saying, well, that was wrong, but we are still going to have to look at this in the future. From Crystal Dynamics side of things, I look at this as anything but blame. This is about as soft a landing as you could hope for if you're running that studio where Square Enix says, well, it didn't really match up. And to some extent, that's on us. It's the job of the parent company. It's the job of the executives. It's the job of that C-level suite to figure out how to best allocate their talent and resources. And Square looks back at this and says, we did that wrong. We did not maximize your dollars, investors, but we learned a number of things. We learned what doesn't work, which is important. We learned that we might need, if we're on Square Enix side, to make a new studio to find people with this specific skill set to operate for this specific genre. And it's not going to be just as easy as asking one of our square pegs to go at it and figure something out. And to my mind, that's good. This is what you want executives of game companies to be doing. You, You might not like that the industry trend is towards gas. I don't blame you for that. But once you've established that it is, and believe me, it is, then you want them to be able to look at things and say, ah, we did that wrong, but let's not make that mistake again. Let's learn. Human beings, even ones that run giant companies, aren't perfect. But if you can learn from the mistakes that you made, that's a good thing. And I'm pretty hopeful that the next time Square Enix tries this, they won't jump into the same kind of potholes that Crystal Dynamics did. And if you do love the Avengers, I don't know that there's a reason to believe that this is the end 
of the Avengers project. One thing that this has going for it is that it's in existence. It's already built. Square Enix can use Avengers, to the extent Marvel allows them to do so, as a bit of a sandbox to try different things, to, you know, mess with the XP curve, to try to sell you that XP back. I don't recommend these, but they're learning, right? And or to do other things that might benefit their future gas activities so that the next one doesn't have nearly the problems that the Avengers has. That's why I named this Lessons from the Avengers. In an ideal world, nobody would make any mistakes. Every game would be great right off the bat, but we don't live in that ideal world. And I think at the end of the day, it's a good thing that you see statements like this, and I would never characterize it in the way that VGC did. Thank you for this wonderful conversation here in virtual legality. I hope you liked it as much as I apparently just did in this extra. If you like this stuff, business and law, video games, and pop culture, please consider supporting the channel at Patreon or some of our other methods listed in the description of this video or just subscribing and telling your friends that we're here. Every little bit helps. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.